business of God as he develops us as women ministers is to conform us to the original image and the original image is the image of a son. Dr. Lucy Nanga, Senior Pastor Fountain Gate Church and Visionary Network of Women Ministers Kenya, Women of Grace and Lack Ladies and Deborah Company among others. Her passion is to empower women ministers. He said, I will put an enmity between you and them. That's where the battle is. You can still conceive a vision in your old age. God is in the business of renewing. And how does God renew? God renews by His voice. Join us as we receive the ministry of the world. My focus has been on the lamp as your spirit. Uh, based on Proverbs 20 verse 27 that says, The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inner depths of his heart. I have also referenced Luke chapter 11, verse 33 to 36, and also the same repeated in Matthew chapter 6, verse 22 to 23, that basically shows that the lamp of the body is the eye, and I've taught you that the eye is also another symbol for the spirit or represent the spirit. When the Bible talks about the inner eye, it's talking about your spirit. When the Bible talks about the eyes of your understanding, then that is talking about your spirit. And the Bible says in Luke chapter 11, verse 34, that the lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body is also full of light. So the light, the illumination of your body is dependent on the state of your eye, which is your spirit. But when your eye is bad, your body is full of darkness. And you will believe that, you know, what Proverbs 20 verse 27 says, that the spirit of the man is the lamp of the Lord and searching all the inner depths of his heart. So God uses your spirit to search the inner depths of your heart. That means if your body, if your eye is good, your whole body is full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body also is full of darkness. Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. Even then, if then your body is full of light, having no dark part, the whole body will be full of light as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. I want you to continue reading those verses. And therefore, as we see, your spirit is good. And when your spirit is good, your whole life is good. And that the spirit is what gives life to your entire being. Of course, this does not mean that your soul and your body is not important. That is not what I am saying. Indeed, the Bible says, don't you know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? And we know that the temple was made up of three parts, the outer court, the inner court, and the innermost court, or the outer court, the holy place, and the most holy place is made up of three parts, just like you're made up of three parts, your body, your soul, and your spirit. So it doesn't mean that you are, your body and your soul are not important. Indeed, Paul exalting the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, he will say, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you can see there, Paul refers to your spirit, Paul refers to your soul and body. In the book of 1 John chapter 3, John writing to the elder, he says, the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth, behold, I pray that you may prosper. Is that the one? No, no, I think it's uh, 1 John chapter, is it chapter 2? Is it chapter 3? Let's get to the right one. To the elder Gaius, whom I love in truth, behold, beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul also 
prospers, just as your soul also prospers. So we see that your soul and your body are third John. Sorry, it's not first John, it is actually third John. Sorry for that confusion. Third John chapter one. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things, be in good health, meaning your body, just as also your soul prosper. So we are not saying that the body and the soul are not important, but what you are saying, if your spirit is good, your whole body is good and your soul is good. In other words, your life should be directed by your spirit, your spirit, which is largely, uh, you know, um, what God communicates to. There is a, a spirit in man and the breath of the Almighty gives it uh, breath. And therefore, your spirit is the one that communicates to the spirit of God. Therefore, your life should be directed by your spirit, and your spirit should largely be governed by the spirit of God. What we said was the lamp has, you know, is, has a vessel, and the vessel has oil, and, the, and then there is a wick. And I told you the wick is your spirit, and the oil is the spirit of God, and the wick is what transports the oil so that the wick can light. So if you are not able to draw from the spirit of God, from the oil of God, then you cannot be able to light, you know. And therefore, how you keep your spirit determines the illumination that you have in your life. That is why we must continue to trim our lamp so that our lamps can be illuminated. You know, Exodus 27, I'll repeat some of these things as we close. Exodus 27 verse 21, the Bible says about Aaron and his sons, the duty they were given, among the duties they were given, there were many others, but one of the duties they were given, in verse 21, the Bible says, in the tabernacle of meeting, outside the veil, which is before the testimony, Aaron and his son shall tend it. Let's read from 20 so that we put it in context. There is no hurry. And you shall command the children of Israel that they may bring you pure oil of pressed olives for the light to cause the light, the lamp, to burn continually. Don't jump. Just stay there. And you shall command the children of Israel that they bring you pure oil of pressed olives of the light for the light to cause the lamp to burn continually. Remember the story in Matthew 25, just stay here, uh, what the Bible talks about the five virgins were foolish. They did not carry enough oil with them. Therefore, their light could not be able to burn continually. And then the other five carried enough oil. Therefore, they, their light could burn or their lamp could burn continually. And this is the same thing that God commanded uh, Moses to command Aaron and his sons that they should make sure that the children of Israel will bring the offering, which was the olive oil, and to make sure that the lamp burns continually. But it was not only the oil that caused the lamp to burn continually. It is what also is found in Exodus 27 verse 21. In the tabernacle of meeting, outside the veil, which is before the testimony, Aaron and his son shall tend it. So it was not just the oil, but the tending of the lamp. They will tend it from evening until morning before the Lord. It shall be a statute forever to their generation on behalf of the children of Israel. And that word tending means both in the Hebrew language and also in the Greek language, it means to arrange, to set in order, and to prepare. That is why in Matthew 25, Jesus said, watch therefore, you know, so that you can be prepared when the Son of Man will come. So it's preparation, preparing the, 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 the lamp, tending the lamp, and by tending the lamp, you actually tend the wick, you trim the wick, you order it, you set it in order, you dress it, you dress it. And as you remember, the ten virgins had to trim their lamps also. In Matthew 25, we can show that one, verse 7, the Bible says, then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamp. And that word trimmed there 
is similar to the word tend in Exodus 27 verse 21 and it means again to set in order to adorn so it adds some another aspect to adorn or to dress it or to decorate so the point I wanted to bring here is that you don't only tend your lamp by trimming it by putting it is or in order by removing the excess flesh but you tend your spirit also by adorning it and clothing it. And I have uh, given you the scriptures that I want to give you again that are found in both Ephesians and Colossians. By the way, you can never separate those two books. So if you are reading, make sure you read them together. They have a lot of similarities. And in Ephesians and also Colossians, and I'll pick out a few verses, and also in Romans and Galatians, refers to this. The Bible keeps talking about putting on and putting off. Putting on and putting, putting off and putting on. That means if you put off, you have to put on. And many times we have emphasized on putting off, but then we do not know after we put off, what do we do? So the spirit must not only be trimmed, but it must be clothed. That's where to you clothe your inner man. Remember Ephesians 3.16, the Bible says that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with the might through his spirit in the inner man. And I told you that inner man is your spirit. To be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Colossians 3, verse 8 to 9 will tell us. Colossians 3, I'll repeat them. I'll repeat them annoyingly to you until you never forget. But now, you yourselves are to put off. So you see, the Bible says you yourself are to put off all this. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, Feel the language out of your mouth and, you know, out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man and his deeds. But this does not end there. So in verse 14 of the same scripture, the Bible talks about but above all things put on love. But maybe we just uh, follow it. Let's read from verse 10. It's okay. It's all right. Annoyingly, I'll repeat these scriptures until you never forget them. And have put on the new man. So you can see put off, put on the new man who is being, who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him. The image of him who created him. Remember I told you man was created from the dust of the earth. And the dust of the earth was not the image of God. God only breathed or breathed his spirit into the man. So that is the similarity between man and God. There is a spirit in man, and the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. So it, was, it is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Verse 11, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Amen. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering. And I'll be coming back to that verse in a short while. What I'm trying to say is, we don't only trim the lamp and remove what is excess, but we also adorn and clothe the lamp. We adorn and clothe the lamp. And in the last two weeks, I talked about clothing our spirit with love. Colossians 3, verse 14. But above all things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And you can refer to my teaching two weeks ago. The second thing I talked about, that is last week, we need to adorn or clothe our spirit with praise. Isaiah chapter 61 will talk about the, the oil of joy and the, and the garment of praise for the spirit 
of heaviness, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And I told you there are two things that replaces that spirit of heaviness. One of it is thanksgiving. The other one is joy, especially expressed through prayer and singing. And please refer to my teaching. The third garment that I want to go into in the few remaining minutes um, is the garment called humility. Is a garment called humility. Let's go back to Colossians. Let's go back to Colossians where we read Colossians chapter 8. Chapter 3, sorry, verse 12. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. The Bible says, Therefore, as elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering. So I've talked about putting on love, above all things, which is a bond of perfection. We talked about clothing, adorning your spirit with the garment of praise that replaces the spirit of heaviness. There is another garment that is very important as we wind up this series, which we need to clothe ourselves with. It's called humility. Humility. Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long suffering. We need to clothe our spirit with a garment called humility. And I would like to refer you, there is a book, I think it's the first book Pastor James wrote. It's called The Garment of Humility, a very great book, and you can get yourself a copy that I've expounded this uh, so much, therefore you can refer to it. Proverbs 16, verse 19, I hope you don't get tired of us reading many verses. Uh, that's who we are. We must read verses. We preach nothing else than God's word. Uh, Proverbs 16, verse 19, the Bible says, Better is to be of a humble spirit. I wanted to show you there is what is called a humble spirit, and that humble spirit is that humility is a garment. Okay? Colossians 3, verse 12, put on, among other things, humility. That humility is a garment you adorn your spirit with. Just like you wear clothes on the outside, your spirit needs adorning. Your spirit needs clothing. And one thing that you must clothe your spirit with, according to Colossians 3.12, is humility. And when you look at Proverbs 16, verse 19, better it is to be of a humble spirit with a lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Let me give you another scripture, Proverbs 29, verse 23. I rarely preach without mentioning Proverbs because I love it. A man's pride will bring him low, but the humble in spirit will retain honor. We may be revisiting this verse again, but for now I want you to see there is something called humble in spirit. Humble in spirit. 16, verse 19, we call it a humble spirit. 29 verse 23, humble in spirit. Let me read you another one. Uh, actually, going back to Proverbs 16, uh, let's look at verse 18. The Bible says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Now, we see there is a humble spirit and there is a haughty spirit. A haughty spirit is a proud spirit. And the, 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 the humble spirit is a spirit that we need to clothe ourselves with. Let me read you another scripture. Ecclesiastes, verse 7, chapter 7, sorry, verse 8. Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, verse 8. The Bible says that the end of a matter is better than its beginning. The patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. So, Proverbs 16, verse 18, and Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 8, talks about a haughty or a proud spirit. While Proverbs 16, verse 19, and Proverbs 29, verse 23, talks about a humble spirit. 
So the opposite of humility is being proud or haughty. And we may not have time to talk so much about it, but I want to say, you know, a, 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 a haughty spirit or a proud spirit is expressed in rebellion, stiff-necked, inflexible, to have a hard spirit, one that is not malleable, one that is not flexible, one in which, you know, this spirit, proud spirit, which is a hard spirit, a rebellious spirit, is a spirit in which God cannot be able to write his word or his law because God will only be able to write his law in the, in the, in the heart of flesh in the heart of flesh, or a spirit that is broken. I'll be showing you some of the scriptures, but let me start with Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33. Jeremiah 31, verse 33. The Bible says, But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. But I want us to see it in King James Version, because there is something I need to show you. Show me in the old King James Version. The Bible says that, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts. I wanted you to see that. The, the New King James and other translations would translate it as mind, really. But that inward part is, 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 be, is, is, is wider than just the mind as we know it. So the, New King, the Old King James puts it correctly. It says, I will write my law in their inward parts. And write it in their heart. So I wanted you to see there is the inward part. That inward part represents your inner being. In fact, one of the words used there is your belly, out of their belly. And you know, the Bible says out of their belly is streams of living water. It's not your stomach, it's your spirit. And so God says, I'll put my law in their inward part. And that law is written by the finger of God, but can only be written in the inward part that is not hardened. A heart, you know, the Bible talks about a heart of flesh, not a hardened heart. That's why the Bible says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Because when you are hardened, God cannot be able to write his law in your spirit. Therefore, a proud spirit is a rebellious spirit, one that is stiff, one that is hardened, one that is inflexible, one that cannot be molded by God. While a humble spirit is one that is broken, one that is able to bring itself low, one that knows how to bow. That's a, that's a humble spirit. One that is broken, one that knows how to bow, one that knows how to come low. You know, that is why David, and we'll be coming back to him, in Psalms 51 verse 17, he will say, the sacrifices of God, the sacrifices, what can please God above anything else that you could give? You know, many people think that, you know, by their giving their money, they are giving many things that we give, which is good. We believe in that. But that's not the most important. The Bible says the sacrifices of God are, one, a broken spirit. So it's not a hardened spirit. It's one that is broken. A broken and a contrite heart. This, O oh God, you will not despise. So there are things that God can despise. And let me tell you, it's true that God despises many of our offerings. May the Lord help us. Amen. Because many of us give out of, you know, you, you know, in fact, I was sharing just as a break, I was sharing with somebody, you know, as people crave, you know, for churches to go back because of many, many other good reasons, I was telling them, you know, if you are a true believer, you don't need to be in a, in a, in a physical place to give your offering. Because, you know, and if you're not giving your offering and your tithes, 
and your other, off, you know, fast fruit and many other offerings. Just because we do not meet where now you are prompted by the basket or the time to give your offering, there is a problem. And that is why there are many things we bring to God and God does not accept them. You remember Abel and Cain? God accepted Abel's sacrifice. He refused Cain's sacrifice. So God can reject your offerings. God can reject my offerings. But there is one thing the Bible assures us that God will never reject. It is called a broken spirit. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. This, oh God, you will not despise. There are things God can despise. But God will not despise a humble spirit. And I will show you why. The other scripture is Isaiah 57. I want to read it. Isaiah 57. I feel very relaxed tonight. Amen. Isaiah 57 from verse 14. From verse 14. Isaiah 57 verse 14. The Bible says, And one shall say, this is in New King James, Heap it up. Heap it up. Prepare the way. Take the stumbling block out of the way of my people. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, but I dwell with this one, with him who has a contrite and humble spirit. I love that. I want to read it again. For thus says the high and lofty one who is lifted, who inhabits eternity. You know, he is, he, he is eternity itself. Whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, but with someone. With him who has a contrite and humble spirit. That is why David will confidently say, in uh, that verse we have read, don't go there. He will confidently say that, you know, a, cont a humble spirit and a contrite heart, God will not despise. And it says, I dwell in a very high place, a holy place, with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Even though God is high, lives higher than us, he lives with some people who have a contrite and humble spirit. I want us to read it in NLT uh, because I liked how NLT and then message, they bring it a bit different. NLT, the Bible says, the high and lofty one who lives in eternity, the holy one says, I live in the high and holy place with those who, whose spirits are contrite and humble. I restore the crushed spirit of the humble and revive the courage of those with repentant hearts. One of the things I'll show you shortly is that, you know, one expression of humility is repentance, the ability to repent, you know, and the, it's right there. Let's see it in message. Let's see it in message. The Bible says, let's see it in message. A message from the high and towering God who lives in eternity, whose name is holy. I live in the high and holy place, but also with the low spirited, the spirit crushed. And what I do with that one is I put new spirit in them, get them up and on their feet again. Don't you love that version? <laughs> Let me read just a portion of it once again. I love it. I live in the high and holy place, but with the low spirited, the spirit crushed. And what I do is put new spirit in them, get them up and on their feet again. Hallelujah. I think that should encourage you to put on this garment of humility. There are several things I want to say about humility. First is that humility, as we saw, put on, let's go back to Colossians 3, verse 12. Colossians 3, verse 12, we go back. Therefore, as elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, 
kindness, humility, meekness, and long suffering. So we are talking about putting on humility. So humility is something we do. It's something that we do. We deliberately decide to be humble. You know, I always tell people, don't tell God to humble you. God is not there to humble you. Humility is your responsibility. And when you reject humility, what God does is not to humble you, but to humiliate. And we see that by with the children of Israel. Whenever they refused to humble themselves, God humiliated them. In fact, one time he will say, I will expose your scat. I will expose your nakedness. You know, I will expose your scat. I will expose your nakedness. You can check Nahum chapter 3 verse 5. God uncovered their scat and their nakedness and brought them to shame. So humility is a personal responsibility. We deliberately decide to take a lower place. And I will be showing you how Christ also did it. But we deliberately take a lower place. Just like Christ did in Philippians chapter 2. The Bible says, let this mind be new that was also in Christ Jesus. That though he was, verse 6, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. In other words, he emptied himself, taking the form of a body servant and coming in the likeness of men. So he took a lower position and being found in appearance as a man, he, Christ, not God, humbled himself. So you cannot keep praying, God, humble me. That is not a good prayer. You need to change your prayer and say, God, I humble myself. I humble myself. Don't ask God to humble you. Because when that happens, then you might face some humiliation. And God does not want to humiliate anybody. God only humiliates the proud. That is why the Bible says God resists the proud, not the sinner. Not the sinner. You see, the Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In fact, God sees us like we have not sinned. He's our advocate. I'm not saying you sin, but I'm saying God does not resist the sinner. You remember the two men that went to pray and one said, you know, I fast twice a week. I am like this. And the other one said, God help me. And he was a sinner. So God does not resist the sinners. God resists the proud. He is against the proud. So humility is something we do is a personal responsibility. James chapter 4, verse 6 to 10 will tell us, but he gives more grace. You know, there is grace and there is more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee away from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your lot be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. So I want to make this emphasis. Humility is our personal responsibility. It's something we do deliberately, consciously. In other words, we take a lower position than what we are actually. We choose a lower position. But then when we choose that lower position, the Bible says God will lift us up. God will lift us up. So humility is something we do. That means, in fact, if it's a garment, then you put on daily. You put on daily. You put humility daily. You decide daily to be humble. Number two, humility is a condition of the heart. It's not external. Many people think that, you know, for example, quiet people are humble. 
I'm, it's okay to be quiet if that's the way God made you. But that is not equated to humility. Humility is a condition of the heart. It's an attitude of the heart. That is why the Bible will say, Proverbs 16, verse 1 to 2, the Bible will say, the preparations of the heart belongs to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are pure in his eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirits. The Lord weighs the spirit. Humility is a condition of your heart. God looks at your heart, your attitude, especially in the heart. Your attitude in the heart. So you can have people that look so humble externally, but they are very proud internally. You see, it surprises me when the Bible says that Moses was the meekest man on the earth. Moses himself, he was the meekest man on the earth, the Bible says. And you know this Moses is the one that broke the Ten Commandments. This is the one that made sure they drank, they, 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 they drank the, 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 the water that had the, what he broke. I mean, this is Moses that would get so angry. This is the Moses that would tell God, remove my name from the book of life. But the Bible says now the man Moses was very humble. More than all men who were on the face of the earth. But if you look at the way he led them, externally he may not have looked humble. So God looks at the heart. Is the attitude, is the condition of your heart. Number three, we humble, just some few things uh, that I want to put across. We humble ourselves before the Lord, not before men. So humility is before the Lord. Humility is to be before the Lord. The same scripture we read, the same scripture we read, James chapter 4, verse 10. The Bible says, no, let's start with 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. Let's start with, yeah, or even that one, that's okay. That's okay, let's start with James, James 4. Let's go back to James 4. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. So we are not, our, our humility is not outward show. You know, there are people who behave very well when their pastor is there. There are people who be children who behave very well when their mothers and fathers are there. You know, when their bosses are there, they are very humble. You know, they, they, they walk very calmly. They do nothing. But as soon as they leave, they change. So our humility is not before men. It is in the sight of the Lord. We humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. First Peter chapter 5, verse 5 will say, we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. So what I'm saying, humility is to God. Humility is not the same as inferiority complex. There are people who... Do not have, you know, uh, they, they are not sure, I would say, in, in, the, in, the, in the world, they'll talk about self-esteem. But for me, I'll call it a son of God. You must know you are a son of God. And if you are a son of God, you are a son of the king. You are a son of the one who owns the universe. You are the son of those who own the earth and the heavens. So you must have that confidence. So it's not about, you know, drawing maps on, you know, when you ask something you don't know, you're, you know, that's not what I'm talking about. But the Bible says, likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another. And be, this is another scripture right there showing you, be clothed with humility. Be clothed with humility. Please repeat after me. Be clothed with humility. Please repeat it after me again. Be clothed with humility. Let me annoy you and tell you to repeat it again. Be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but give grace to the humble. Verse 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. He may exhort you in due time. John will tell us, humble yourself in the sight of God. He will lift you up. 
Peter will tell us, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exhort you in due time or in the process of time. So I want to emphasize our humility is not towards men. Our humility is towards God. It's towards God. So that what we do in the open is the same way we live in the secret. Or how we live in the secret is the same way we live in the open. Because our humility is unto God. So let me repeat what I've said. I've said humility is your personal or my personal. I'm not telling you. I'm telling myself too. It's my personal responsibility. Humility is an attitude of the heart. And our humility is towards God. It's not inferiority complex. No, we are God's sons. We are, we are, we are, we are heirs. Can you imagine? We are heirs of the kingdom. Joint heirs. Hallelujah. You know what is to be joint heirs? That scripture in Romans, joint heirs. What joint heirs mean? It doesn't mean that there is a piece of land, therefore it will be divided into two, and we get one and Christ gets one. No, that one means that that one piece is much ours than is that like it is his. The Bible says, if children, then hairs. And it's not just hairs, it's hairs of God. Hey, hey, my friend, it's not just hairs. It's hairs of God and joint hairs with Christ. That is why the Bible says, as he is, so are we. You know, there are people when we tell them we are firstborn, they say, why are you comparing with yourself with Christ? But why not? We are heirs of God. We are joint heirs with Christ. And as he is, so are we in this world. If indeed we suffer with him, there is a condition there, that we may also be glorified together. And all this suffering means just going through pain to obey God. That we may also be glorified together. Amen. So it's not about inferiority complex. It's something that we choose to do and we humble ourselves before the Lord. Quickly, I want to show you how humility is expressed. How humility is expressed. One, and we have seen some of these scriptures. Humility is expressed in submission. Humility is firstly expressed in submission. Going back to the scriptures we have read, James chapter 4, verse 6. Uh, James chapter 4, verse 6, the Bible says, uh, let's start with uh, the, the, the previous one. Okay, verse 6, let's start with verse 6, that's okay. But he gives more grace, therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble, verse 7. Therefore, submit to God. So the first expression of humility is submission to God. And how do we submit to God? We submit to his word that comes to us. Look at now, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. So the first submission is to God, according to James chapter 4. The second submission in 1 Peter chapter 5 is submission to your elders. Let the elders who rule well be worthy of double honor. There are people who rule over your life. We need to submit ourselves. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. You cannot separate submission from humility. So you submit to three categories of people, if I call it that way, for this particular purpose. You submit to God, according to James chapter 4. You submit to your elders, and we submit to one another. That is why you can't just say you are submitting to God and you cannot submit to the people that God has put over your life. Neither can you, and you are not even submitting to the people that are your brothers to one another. So it's not just submission to God. It's not just submission to elders. It's submission to one another. That is why even husbands, 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 not because I'm a wife, but I will tell you, husband, you know, you must sometime submit because there is submission to one another, especially if you can sense the voice of God in your wife. 
You need to submit to the voice of God in your wife. Otherwise, you can't be saying, I am the head, I am the head, I am the head, I am the head. No, you must be submitting to the voice of God. And the voice of God comes to us through the people that God has put over our lives. Those are the elders and the people and the brothers that God has put over our lives. Sometimes God will speak to your brother. And that is why sometimes you need to see your husband as your brother, and you need to see your wife as your brother so that you can be able to hear the voice of God that comes through them. If Moses did not submit to his wife, you know, when the angel of God came to destroy him, to kill him, can you imagine God sends him to go and deliver, but God comes to kill him. It was his wife Zipporah that had the voice of God, circumcised the son. It was not the responsibility, I believe, of the women to circumcise their son. But Zipporah did it. And that saved them. If Nabo submitted to his wife, Abigail, who heard the voice of God, he would not have died. So what I'm saying is this, not to distort God's order, but I'm saying there are times when the voice of God will come through a brother. And that brother can be your wife. Never forget that. That brother can be your husband. I'm telling you wives, sometimes learn to listen to your husband, not just as the head of your home, but your brother to whom God speaks through. And that is important. So submission, submission. Number two. Humility is expressed in constant repentance before God. We saw that scripture as we read Isaiah 57. I'll not go back there. Constant repentance before God. You know, and repentance there means confession of sin, but also desire to change. Constant repentance before the Lord. The confession of sin is included, but more so the desire to change. Change. Number three, humility is expressed in dependence on God for everything that you do. Humility is expressed when we depend on God for everything that we do. The Bible says in Psalms 10, verse 4 to 7, it says, The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is none of his thoughts. You know, there are people who will always his, his, his ways are always prospering. Your judgments are far above, out of his sight. As for all his enemies, that's God now. But let's go back to verse 4. The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is none of his thoughts. I want to tell you, you are, how you depend on God, even for simple things. You know, you can get a job, therefore your job is able to cover your house rent, your job is able to cover your food, therefore you never depend, you forget that it is God. In fact, pride mostly comes when people are, you know, keep going high the, 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 the radar. You know, they become proud. It's very, people who have nothing, sometimes it's hard for them to become uh, proud. That's why the Bible says the poor gladly receive him. But those who are rich, those who have things. And you know, rich here is not in the riches the way you think about it. It's when you are self-sufficient. So how you depend on God for simple things. I want to tell you, brethren, start to depend on God for everything. There is nothing that should be your own. You should just depend on God. Just depend on him. Number four. Humility is expressed in how we treat the brotherhood, especially in considering others better than ourselves. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 will say, Philippians chapter 2, let's go to Philippians chapter 2. The Bible says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, again, humbleness of mind, let each esteem others better than than himself. That means there are times you may be right, but you can give up your rights for the brothers. That's humility. It's not defeat. There are moments you may know that your husband is, is, is wrong and you're right, but you give him. That's loneliness of mind. There are moments you'll know that your, your wife is wrong, but you give in. That's loneliness of your mind. There, there, there are times you know the brothers are wrong, but because of 
wanting oneness with them, and you believe down the road, somehow God will speak to them, you can give in because you're considering them better than yourself. If you are this type of person that is never wrong, that can never give in for another, that is pride. It doesn't matter whether you are right. No, it's not about being right. It's about the state of your mind. So considering others better than yourself, so you give in. Number five, Humility is expressed in ability to be guided and counseled. When you can be guided and counseled. Number six, the ability to take correction. And I'll give for those two, the reference is Proverbs chapter 15, verse 32. I want to read it quickly. I just have a few minutes. Proverbs 15, verse 32, the Bible says, He who disdains instruction despises his own soul, but he who heeds rebukes gets understanding. The fear of the Lord is, in his, is the instruction of wisdom and before honor is humility. The ability to be guided, to be counseled, and the ability to be corrected, to accept correction. It's painful. I mean, I don't like to be corrected. Maybe you are better than me. I don't like. It's very hurtful. But yet... As painful as it is, the ability to be corrected and you accept correction in humility is a sign of humility, of expression of humility. You know, there is this king, just give me a few minutes, Uzziah, Uzziah that is recorded in 2 Chronicles chapter 26. 2 Chronicles chapter 26. This is a king, and I'll read it just in context. Second uh, Chronicles chapter 26. Let's go there quickly. The Bible says, I'll read it very quickly. It's a few chapters. Now all the people took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king instead of his father Amaziah. He built Ella, then restored it to Judah after the king rested with his fathers. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name. You know all good kings, they had mothers. His mother's name was Jecoliah of Jerusalem. Read your Bible, you see that. I like just making fun of it. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. He sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. Now he went out and made war against the Philistines and broke down the wall of God, the wall of Jabne, the wall of Ashdod. And he built cities around Ashdod and among the Philistines. God helped him against the Philistines, against the Arabians who lived in Garbal and against the Munites. Also, the Ammonites brought tribute to Uzziah. His fame spread as far as entrance of Egypt, for he became exceedingly strong. And Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate, at the valley gate, at the corner buttress of the wall. Then he fortified them. Also, he built towers in the desert. He dug many wells, for he had much livestock, both in the lowlands and in the plains. He also had farmers and vine dressers in the mountains of, or in, and in the Camel, for he loved the soil. I keep saying he was a Kikuyu. Moreover, Uzziah had an army of fighting men who went out to war by companies, according to the number of their role, as prepared by Jael, the scribe, Messiah, the officer, under the hand of Ananiah, one of the king's captains. The total number of chief officers of the mighty men of valor was 2,600. And under the authority was an army of 307,500 that made war with mighty power to help the king against the enemy. Then Uzziah prepared for them for the entire army shields, spears, helmets, body armor, bows, and slings to cast stones. And he made devices in Jerusalem, invented by skillful men, to be on the towers and the corners, to shoot arrows and large stones. So his fame spread and far and wide, and for he was marvelously helped, till he became very strong. But, there is a but, when he was strong in his heart, what happened? He was lifted up 
to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. This was not his responsibility as a king. It was the responsibility of, 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 of the priest. Now I want you to see something here. So Azariah the priest went in, went in after him, and with, and with him were eight priests of the Lord, valiant men. And they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priest, the son of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. You have no honor from the Lord God. Then Uzziah became furious. What I wanted you to see is that instead of humbling himself, listening to instructions that he was given, he would have been forgiven. He had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was angry with the priest because of his pride, leprosy broke out on his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord beside the incense altar. The next verse. And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked at him, and there on his forehead he was leprous. So they thrust him out of that place. Indeed, he was so hurried to get out because the Lord had struck him. Why did the Lord struck him? strike him? Because if he listened to the counsel, if he listened to the advice he was given, he would have been saved. And he died a leper. And you know what it meant to be a leper? Is that you were cast out. Let me just quickly give you the results of humility because we'll not repeat this again. Just allow me to do that. I'll not explain them. I'll just give you the results of humility. Number one is grace. We have already seen God resists the proud but he gives grace to the humble. Number two is exhortation. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. He will lift you up in due season. Number three is wisdom. You can read Proverbs 11, verse 22. Number four is riches. You can read Proverbs 22, verse four. Number five is honor. Proverbs 15, verse 33. Number six is rest. Matthew 11, from verse 28. Number seven is God's presence. Isaiah 66 from verse one. Number seven is forgiveness. And you can go and refer to the story of David, how he humbled himself. He actually put on, uh, uh, when the, 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 the prophet came and told him, initially he had refused. When he accepted, the Bible says, he said, I have sinned against the Lord and God forgive him. And you can read the story of David uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 12 from the verse 13, I mean from the first verse up to the last verse, you can see that David humbled himself before the Lord. Hezekiah, you can read how he humbled himself. Isaiah chapter 38, 2 Chronicles chapter 32. Let me repeat them. I think I said very quickly. Grace, 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 5. Exaltation, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. Wisdom, Proverbs 11, verse 22. Riches, Proverbs 22, verse 4. Honor, Proverbs, 22, Proverbs 15, verse 33. Rest, Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. 7 is God's presence, Isaiah 66, from verse 1. And finally, chapter 8, I mean forgiveness, which you will find in the story of David. God bless you so much. It's been an honor to minister to you. And I bless the Lord for that. The Order of Deborah by Dr. Lusenganga, a book that intensively opens up the three-sided face of life and ministry function of a woman. That is the prophetic order, the governmental order, and the family order. To get your copy of the Order of Deborah, please call 0716-919-783. This book is also available at Keswick Bookshop, Textbook Center, and Amazon.com.